Shalom, chesed, uvuchim, abayim. Peace, grace, and welcome to another edition of Penenei HaTorah, Pearls of Torah with Yeshivat Shuvu. I'm Atsur Kabeza Perez, and this week's Torah portion is Parashat Miketz. The following parashot deal with the life of Yosef and his relationship with his brothers, and his life in exile. These following parashot deal significantly with the first coming of Messiah, and we see as is well known, the parallels between Yosef and Yeshua. We're going to analyze specific characters in the story, the meanings of their names and their functions, so that we can learn how to apply it in our lives. For us as the body of Messiah are many different parts, but we are one body, the body of Messiah. And we need to be unified and bring restoration, although we are different, because this is what Messiah calls us to do. And so we begin the parasha, and I would like to start by focusing on chapter 41, verse 12. It says the following. Now there was a young Hebrew man with us there, a servant of the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each man he interpreted according to his own dream. Now, what's going on here is we know previously Yosef was imprisoned and he was with two servants of Pharaoh who had dreams. Yosef interprets the dreams and one is released and one is killed. So the one who is released and restored to his position now remembers Yosef as there is no one there to interpret the dream for Pharaoh. And Yosef is immediately the first person who comes to his mind. Now, it's very interesting that he described Yosef by using three specific words. And so, if we read it in Hebrew, it says the following. Veshamitanu na'ar, the first word. Ivri, evet. So, three words. Na'ar, Ivri, and evet. Rashi takes note that na'ar, the youth or lad, may seem as an unwise and unfitted person for such a high position being that he is youthful. But we know, as Rav Shavu writes to Timothy, let no man despise thy youth. When Hashem is with us, it doesn't matter what age we are, Hashem can use us in any position, in any time, in any place. It's also interesting to note that within a lot of rabbinic texts, Na'ar is associated with Mitatron, the messenger of Hashem's presence. The other words, are also associated with Mitatron, and they are Ivri, a Hebrew, which Rashi states in this context is referring to the fact that he is a foreigner and doesn't know the language of the Egyptians. Evan, which is a servant or a slave, refers to the fact that in Egyptian law, a slave was not able to become a ruler or dress in princely robes. So he has three strikes against him. And it's understood from Chazal that these things were mentioned by this particular servant of Pharaoh as a way to say, this is why I didn't mention him earlier. He's got these three strikes against him. But now that no one is able to interpret your dream, I might as well mention him because he's the only one capable to interpret the dream. And so we also have the use of this word Hebrew, a Hebrew, specifically used for three individuals. Yes, the word Hebrews is used collectively for the Hebrews being redeemed from Egypt, but as an individual, three specific individuals are used to be an example of a Hebrew. The first is Abraham Avinu. Right now we have Yosef, and later on we have Jonah, Yonah. The sages ask the question, why are these three individuals given the title Hebrew? And so they ask, what do they have in common? In the Zohar, Parashat Day, they go over the parallels that these three have in common. They are both somewhat in exile. Although Abraham is going to the land of Canaan, he's leaving his home country, everything he knows. He's going off into a new land. And at that point in time, Canaan was full of pagans. As far as Yosef, he's cast out of his home country 
and sent to Mitzrayim, sent among the nations, the powerful nation of that generation. And as for Yonah, Jonah, he is sent to be a witness to the enemies of Israel. And so we know the story of Jonah. He's on the boat. There's a terrible storm. He's on his way to Tarshish. Some consider that to be a city in Sfarad. And as he's on this boat and there's this storm, the people on the boat, they start to ask questions. What's going on? And the Zohar continues and says that the sailors on the boat with him asked him, tell us what is your occupation? Namely, what is your daily business? And where do you come from? Who are your forefathers? What did Yonah answer? He said to them, Ivri Anuchi, I am a Hebrew, namely from the seed of Abraham, also in association with Yosef, who sanctified the name of his master every day. And I fear Hashem, the Elohim of the heavens. And so this is continued with the following statement, what takes place with these sailors when they see that he is identifying himself with Abraham and Yosef. It says, it is written then, the men were exceedingly afraid. When they heard the name of the Holy One, blessed be he, they were afraid because they knew of the miracles and the mighty deeds performed by the Holy One. And if we read this entire section, it takes notes that the nations are aware of Abraham, aware of Yosef, because the miracles that were taking place among them were seen by the nations around them. And now this is also taking place with Yonah. And it continues, come and see, all of them converted afterwards. When they saw the miracles and the mighty deeds that the Holy One, blessed be he, did to Yonah at the sea, they all saw him falling into the sea and the fish swallowing him in their presence. And when the great fish came before their eyes and vomited him onto the dry land, they came to him and became proselytes. Get in. Come and see. They were all proselytes by conviction, by their own heart's conviction, and became knowledgeable in the Torah and high sages, and also among the wisdom of the sages, because the Holy One, blessed be He, favored them and all those who approached Him to sanctify His name openly. These men, according to the Midrash, sanctified his name openly. And this was a public act of tshuva, which enabled them to be embraced by Hashem, as the Midrash says. And the Holy One, blessed be He, favored them and all those who approached him to sanctify his name openly. And so we learn that the specific use of Hebrew can be associated with a natural branch from the people of Israel being sent among the nations to bring people in the nations closer to Hashem, to bring restoration to those who don't have it. And so, going forward, we move to Genesis Bereshit, chapter 41, verse 45, and it says the following. And Pharaoh called, and Pharaoh called Yosef's name Safnat Baneach, and he gave him as a wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. So Yosef went out over all the land of Egypt. The first thing we have to ask ourselves is this is extremely interesting why Yosef's name was changed, why his identity was changed, and what this name means. Some of the sages understand that part of this word is Hebrew in origin and part of it is Egyptian in origin. In essence, his new identity was a cover-up of his Hebrew identity to give him a Gentile appearance or an Egyptian appearance. And so in Genesis Rabbah 94.4, Rabbi Yochanan said, the name connotes he reveals things that are hidden from the Hebrew root word Safon, which is also north, interestingly, and easily declares them. He reveals things that are hidden and easily declares them. So this is the origin of this particular name that was now given to Yosef. But what is the original meaning of Yosef? And so 
We have the words of Rabbi Menachem Schneerson in Torah Menachem, based on Likutei Sichot, it says the following. When the first Yosef was born, the Torah declares, she called his name Yosef, referring to his mother, saying, may God add Yosef, add, same Hebrew word Yosef, to me, another son. Bereshit 3024. The word Acher, as in the same Acher from the four sages in the Pardes, interestingly enough, the word Acher, another, can also refer to things that are profane. Thus, we find that evil is often called the other side, Sitra Achra. In this spirit, the verse suggests that Yosef was blessed with the power to, one, transform the other into a son, meaning someone from the other side, the side of the profane, or an alienated or outcast Jew or Israelite into an observant Jew. This is extremely interesting. So we see that Yosef, he has his identity changed. And he's a little bit Hebrew, a little bit Egyptian. And his name by itself speaks of adding and restoring an alienated Jew into an observant one or transforming someone from the other side. And so we also have to ask ourselves, what is the significance of the wife, the specific wife that is given to him? It says that in verse 45, Asenat, the daughter of Potifera, priest of On. And so this word On is used specifically throughout the Tanakh to identify with idolatry. And we're not gonna get too much into that but it is something that is worthy of research and study for another time and another parasha. In parasha Yitro, it states the following. Rabbi Abba said, it was not that Yitro was a priest of On, rather of Midian. And someone said to him, it is all one. At first, the father-in-law of Yosef was called a priest of On. Afterward, the father-in-law of Moshe was called the priest of Midian, for all are of the same secret. So there's an association here. Moving forward, it says, When Yitro came and was received by the Holy One, blessed be he, he brought him, Yitro, closer to his worship. And so, in this manner, all proselytes or converts were brought near under the wings of the Shekhinah, the divine presence of Adonai, blessed be he. For the holy name of the Holy One, blessed be he, became sanctified. The holy name becomes further sanctified when the other side becomes broken and yielding as it was with Yitro. Allow me to explain a little bit. What the Midrash is trying to tell us is that the greater the tshuva, the greater the repentance, someone who is a priest in pagan idolatry, who comes to confess the God of Israel, is someone who comes from the longest distance possible from the other side. And when this person does such an act, everyone who witnesses this act bears testimony to the transformation and the work of someone who is restored and welcomed by the Creator. Often, people think that the Creator is only for righteous people, but we know that Messiah Yeshua said He came to help the sick. And so, we see this parallel with Yosef. We see this parallel with many of the great men in the Tanakh, in the Torah. They weren't just there to help the righteous, although they were. They were also there to transform lives and give the opportunity for others who are in need for restoration to be restored. Now, it's interesting that in verses 50 to 52 of chapter 41, Yosef is with his wife and he has two children. He's blessed with two children. 
But notice that the children are born to him before a famine. Now on the Peshat level, of course, there is an actual, literal famine, and he is used to save the lives of multitudes of Gentiles. And in the end of the story, saving the lives of his brothers as well, which was the ultimate goal, to save the lives of his brothers and his family. But we also know that a famine has different applications and can refer to different things. In the book of Amos, chapter 8, verse 11, it says the following. Behold, the days are coming, says Adonai Hashem, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but for hearing the words of Adonai. So we also see that with Yeshua, he warned his followers that they should celebrate while they're with him. But the comforter was to come, but so was difficult, difficult times were to come as well. In Matthew chapter 24, he said that after he was to leave, that lawlessness would be spreading. And because of this, the cold hearts would be increased among those around them. And he also refers to the prophecy of Daniel, which can be connected with the story of Hanukkah, as we are in the season of Hanukkah. And in that story and in that prophecy, we see that there is a type of antichrist that comes to do away with the appointed times of the creator and to change the laws of the creator. And even Yeshua said that many would come in his name, but because of that famine, because of that lack of Torah, which is the knowledge of the word of the creator, the love of many would grow cold. And so also in the spirit of Hanukkah, Messiah was warning to fight against assimilation. Do not go where they say Messiah is here, Messiah is there. If the word of Adonai is not fully received and only bits and pieces are received, then we must question if they are truly of the Messiah. Because we know that the true Messiah comes only to speak the words of his father. And the words of his father are right here in the Tanakh, in the Torah, in all of the Holy Scriptures. And so... We go to Bereshit 41, verse 50 through 52. And we read the following. And to Yosef were born two sons before the years of famine, as we stated, whom Asenat, the daughter of Potiphera, the priest of On, bore to him. Very interesting. It repeats this, right? So what did we learn from Rabbi Menachem Snirshin? That Yosef has the ability to do what? Transform the other into a son and to help an alienated or an outcast Jew to become an observant Jew. So this is transformation and restoration. This is the power of Mashiach ben Yosef. And we know that Yeshua is also Mashiach ben David, but this specific story is speaking up until this point of his function in the role of Yosef. So in verse 51, it says the following, Yosef called the name of the firstborn Menashe, for Elohim has made me forget all my toil in all my father's house. Let's analyze the meaning of this name. Yes, Menashe is an individual on the Peshat level. This is very important. But on the Midrashic level, what can we learn from the meanings of the names and the functions so that we can learn how to apply it in our lives. Menashe. Abarbanel says the following. And so he called his firstborn son Menashe, for God has made me forget. And while I thank God, who has given me relief from all my painful hardships and has allowed me to forget my past misery, I will never forget my past, nor will I ever forget my father's house. Because every time I will call my son by his name, I will be reminded of my father's house and my home country. This is very significant. Though someone may fall off the right path and be cut off from his family or cut off from our heavenly father, there is always hope for restoration. 
there is always a loving father with his arms wide open, ready to welcome you back. And so this root word, Nashani, from the word Menashe, is also used interestingly in Isaiah 44, verse 21. And we have the, com the confirmation right here. It says the following. Remember these, O Yaakov and Israel, for you are my servant, my Evid. I have formed you. You are my servant, O Israel. You will not be forgotten by me. And as it says in Hebrew, Lotinasheni, from the same root word of Menashe. Those who feel forgotten or have forgotten will always have a loving father ready to welcome them back. And this is the work of Messiah. And so we also have an example of Ibn Ezra, who explains that Tinasheni here in Isaiah has the meaning of thou shalt not be forgotten of me. The meaning of the verse is remember me and I will remember thee. Don't forget Adonai. Don't forget your heavenly father. No matter how far you may have fallen from the path, he's still there waiting for you and through Messiah you can return. And so we also have the example of the following verse which says as follows in verse 52. And the name of the second, he called Ephraim. For Elohim has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Fruitful. And so, Targum Unkelos translated as follows. The second one he called Ephraim. For Adonai has increased me in the land of my enslavement. This is extremely interesting because although he is enslaved, he still bears fruit. Although he is enslaved, he is still increasing. It does not matter where you are. If Hashem is with you, no one can be against you. We see the life of Yosef, that he is completely covered by the chesed, the grace of Adonai. Wherever he goes, he is given chen, favor, in the eyes of those who are around him. And those who are a blessing to him, are blessed. And we see this throughout his life. And he is an example of an Ivri, a Hebrew. Another extended meaning of the word Hebrew, which first and foremost, as according to Radak, means a physical descendant of Ever, means one who crosses over. And as we saw in the Midrashim, he does not assimilate, but helps others to cross over to his God. This is why he has the power to be married to the daughter of a pagan priest, but yet he is not influenced by her. He is the one who says, if you're gonna be with me, you're gonna follow my God. And he brings her and, her and his children to worship the true God. And this is a testimony to all of us who, all of us who may be in an environment, sometimes it could be in the workplace, it could be wherever we might have a, a social setting of people that are not believers, or are not people who appreciate the Torah of Adonai, we have to not assimilate. We have to not be influenced by the pagan world around us. We have to be like Yosef and stay committed to our God and be the overpowering factor that draws others to our God. We don't get assimilated. We cause them to come into the worship of the true God in the name of Yeshua. And so, now that we have this foundation of Ephraim and Menashe, what these names on a Midrashic level, what they pertain to restoration and transformation is also stated in the Zohar, we can understand the work of Yosef, the character of Yosef, which reveals to us the work of Yeshua upon his first coming. And so, I would like to move forward to Bereshit 42, verse 7. And in Bereshit 42, verse 7, it says the following. 
Yosef saw his brothers and recognized them. But he acted as a stranger to them and spoke roughly to them. Then he said to them, where do you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. Now, what's going on here is the famine is all over the earth, even in the land of Israel, the land of Canaan. And so the brothers of Yosef have no choice but to go to Egypt and to purchase food. Yosef immediately recognizes them. And when Yosef recognizes them, he decides to disguise himself as a stranger. Now we're gonna analyze this word thoroughly and we're gonna see another meaning to the word that they translate here, specifically as he acted as a stranger. In other version it says he disguised himself. And it says, the root word for Yitnaked is Nachar, which is a pagan, an idolater. And so Rabbeinu Bachia translates this exactly as that. He says that he disguised himself and allowed himself to appear as a Nachar, as a pagan. Sephorno explains that he did so not just by his appearance, but by speaking through an interpreter. Earlier, in a few verses earlier, it speaks of him speaking to a, an interpreter and he uses the word hamelitz. And this word hamelitz is translated by Targum Yonatan in verse uh, 23. And we can go there briefly. It's actually later on, but I would like to go over that passage just to give a little context. It says, Then Yosef gave a command to fill their sacks with grain to restore every man's money to his sack and to give them provisions for their journey of uh, 42, excuse me, 23. Here we go. But they did not know that Yosef understood them, for he spoke to them through an interpreter, Hamelites. So Targum Yonatan refers to the Hamelites specifically as Menashe. He says, but they knew not that Yosef understood the holy language, for Menashe was an interpreter between them. And this is pretty significant for the fact that it shows Yosef's character. Yosef is, in essence, passing on the knowledge of his father and the God of his fathers to his children. He's teaching his children the Hebrew language, which is not just a language to be spoken, but is the holy tongue. It is the holy tongue because within the Hebrew language is an intimate knowledge of our Creator. And this is why everything is recorded in the Hebrew Scriptures with this special and heavenly language. So, moving forward, we see that in 42 verse 7, he allows himself to be a stranger in the eyes of his brothers. Although he recognizes them, he appears as a Gentile to his brothers. And this is very similar to what we see in the book of Luke with Yeshua. In the book of Luke, or I'm sorry, the book of John, chapter seven, verses one through 10, it says the following. After these things, Yeshua walked in the Galilee for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Judean leadership sought to kill him. Now the Judean Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, his brothers, the brothers of Yeshua, depart from here and go into Judea that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world for even his brothers did not believe in him. See the coincidental parallels? No coincidence. This is all ordained by Adonai. Then Yeshua said to them, my time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that, it worked, that its works are evil. Keep in mind that Yosef used to report to his father whatever his brothers did. 
You go up to the feast. I am not yet going up to the feast, for my time is not yet fully come. When he had said these things to them, he remained in the Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were, in secret. So we see that Yeshua also tells us, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Yeshua tells us to be as humble as a dove, but as wise as a serpent. There's a time and a place for everything, and not everything is revealed at every moment in time. And so we see that Yosef was still concealing his identity from his brothers. There was a few things that had to take place before he was able to reveal his identity. And so we move forward. In chapter 42, verse 23, it says the following. But they did not know, as we just stated, going down to 24, we just read 23, and he turned himself away from them and wept. See, he recognizes them, but they didn't recognize him. And so Yosef wept. And we see the same heart in Messiah Yeshua. In the book of Luke, chapter 19, verse 41 and 42, it says, Yeshua saw the city, referring to Jerusalem, to Jerusalem, and wept over it. He cried, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your shalom, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Yeshua said that this revelation would be hidden from their eyes, but only until the point of time. And we will see in the following part short that there is a time for Yosef to reveal his true identity. Moving forward to 42, verse 25, it says, Then Yosef gave a command to fill their sacks with grain, to restore every man's money to his sack, and to give them provisions for the journey. Thus he did for them. So we see in the parasha that Yosef puts them through a test. He wants to see if they still have that same heart, that envious heart. He asked for his younger brother, Benjamin, Benjamin, to see if they were envious of him as they had been with him. And we see that the brothers do have a change of heart. Reuven Reuben, for example, he offers to give his two sons as surety for the life of Benjamin in order to get him to come down, in order to allow, to be allowed by Israel, by Yaakov, the father, to let him go with them. But this wasn't a full teshuva because he didn't offer his own life. The person who offered his own life and therefore was a leader and also associated with the Messiah is Yehuda. Yehuda is the one who is going to offer his life. But it's interesting that although all these tests are going on, although Yosef is making it appear as if they're in danger, he's still providing for them. And so we see in the book of Isaiah, chapter 63, that speaks of in verse 10, but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned himself against them as an enemy and he fought against them a similar situation where this messenger of his presence, as we see in the previous verses in verse 9, that the angel of his presence saved them in his love and in his pity he redeemed them, that there's a time where he is there to redeem and he is there to take care of them. But there's also a time for discipline. There's also a time for a test. We're going to go through tests in our lives, but we have to trust Adonai and his anointed one to know that even though we're going through some type of situation, it's for a purpose. And as we go through the situation, because of our stress, we might not notice, but all of our needs are being met. Everything is provided, as is the situation where Yosef providing for his brothers, giving them their money back, giving them the food. And so at the beginning of this chapter 63, it says, who is this who comes from Edom? with thy garments from Bozrah, the one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling 
in the garments of his strength, I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. He is the mighty one that is able to save, the messenger of Adonai. But yet there's a time where he appears as a foreigner. He may even appear as an enemy, as in the situation with Yosef. And so, even though he appeared as an enemy, it is only to see where the hearts of the brothers were at. Were they ready for the redemption? Were they ready to be restored? We go to chapter 43, verses 8 and 9. In chapters 43, verse 8 and 9, we read the following. Then Yehuda said to Israel, his father, send the lad with me. And he uses the word na'ar. Remember, we refer to the word na'ar as associated with mitatron, the Malach of Hashem. And this is referring to Binyamin. So Yosef is called by this name, and so is Binyamin. In this context, we can understand Binyamin as a picture of someone close to Yosef, but yet under the care of Yehuda. On a prophetic level and a Midrashic level, we can see this as a picture of the Jewish believers still within the Jewish community, still under the Torah of Adonai, raised in this wisdom and these blessings, but with the connection of Yosef. And Binyamin is the person who helps bring restoration between Yehuda and Yosef. Although both Yehuda and Yosef, on a different level, are both associated with the Messiah, they can be a picture of restoration of the testimony of Messiah and the Jewish community. And this will be facilitated by the Jewish believers and those who unite with them to fulfill this task. And so, continuing in 43, verse 8 and 9, it says, We will arise and go, that we may live and not die, because they had to go back to Egypt and get more food. Remember that Yosef tells them, You cannot see me again unless you bring Binyamin with you. And so he keeps Simeon as a prisoner. And this is what it said, both we and you and also our little ones. So Yehuda is trying to convince his father. And he tells his father to let Binyamin go and says the following. I myself will be surety for him. It says, Anochi e'edvenu. He will be an ereb. He will be a guarantor of the life of Binyamin. He's putting his life on the line. He says, I myself will be surety for him. From my hand, from my hand, you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. This is a very significant statement by Yehuda. And we've spoken about this in the past. We've heard Rabbi Shapira teach this, but there are so many different angles that we can apply this in our lives and learn from this. And so in Midrash Tanhuma, it says the following regarding this statement. For your servant has become surety for the lad. When did Yehuda discharge his surety? In the days of Goliath. At the time when Israel was in trouble, what is written in 1 Samuel 17, 16. Then the Philistine drew near at dawn, and in the evening he was cursing and reveling. Shaul, the king, began sending out a herald to proclaim, and it shall come to pass for the man who kills him, Goliath, that the king shall enrich him with great riches. And he, the Philistine, took his stand for 40 days. Yeshai, Jesse, said to his son David, Now is the time to make good on the surety of your ancestor, who became surety for Binyamin, under the hand of his father, as it is stated in Genesis 43, verse 9. I myself will be surety for him. Now go and discharge him from his surety. Thus it is stated in 1 Samuel 17, 18. See also to the welfare of your brothers and take their token. Now their token is nothing but a surety. So Yeshai is imploring David, who is a picture of Messiah in the role of Yehuda in that line, the conquering king, to also do what was done as in the parasha, to put his life at risk for his brothers. And so he went to make 
he went and made good on the surety by killing Goliath. The Holy One, blessed be he, said to him, David, by your life, just as you have risked your life for Shaul, since he is from the tribe of Binyamin, even as your ancestor Yehuda did for Binyamin, so I am placing the sanctuary, the Beit HaMikdash, both within your territory and within the territory of Binyamin. We also see in the same Midrash Tanhuma Buber that it explains, Yosef said to Yehuda, why are you multiplying words? I see that people older than you are standing here without speaking. And is not Reuven older than you? Is not Simeon also older than you? Yet none of them are speaking. But in your case, why are you multiplying your words? Remember, he doesn't know who Yosef is yet. Yehuda said to him, of all these people, not one of them is anxious about Binyamin. Not one of them is so worried about Binyamin as is Yehuda, which this is what makes him a leader. Accept me alone because I stood surety for him, as stated in Genesis 43 verse 9. I myself will be surety for him. Now I said this to my father, that if I do not bring him to you and set him before you, I am sinning before you in two worlds, in this world and in the world to come. As stated in Genesis 44, 32, I am guilty before my father forever. I therefore give my life for him. Yehuda was willing to give his life for Binyamin. And this is the most powerful teaching that we can get from this parasha. And this is in the spirit of Yeshua, our King Messiah. We see in the book of Yochanan, chapter 10, verse 11, the following. It says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. This is what made Yehuda a leader. He was willing to stand against the wolf. He was willing to stand against danger. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hirelings flee because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known by my own. As the father knows me, even so I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep, other acher, I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. And they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. Yeshua, Melech HaMashiach, King of Israel. The Spirit of Messiah is telling all of us that we must be willing to give our lives for our brothers. Yeshua came for his Jewish people. No matter what has happened throughout history, the false representations that have been given in the name of Yeshua, we know by scripture that Messiah Yeshua was always willing to give himself a ransom for his beloved people of Israel, and not just for the natural branches, but as he said right here, and as is expressed through the story of Yosef, also for the other sheep, so that they can come into the fold, and there will be one fold and one shepherd. Shavuot